I sit here today with uh, Harvard's own Graham Allison and the author of Destined for War, one of the most exciting books I've read in the last decade. Uh, so it's an honor, it's an honor to be here with you as a student of China myself and uh, as the, one of the fathers of, uh, call it foreign policy and uh, uh, given your storied history with the, uh, every U.S. president since Reagan and uh, all of the awards, accolades, and advice that you've given our administration over the years. It's just an honor to be here with you. Thank you so much, and thanks for the kind comments about the book. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd love to just dive right into your book. You began the Harvard Thucydides Trap Project and, and wrote this book about just the basis is there are 16 cases in the world where a rising power has, has threatened a ruling power. And I'd love to just start on the top of, you know, in writing and in reading and in setting up this uh, the center, you know, what have your kind of key takeaways been from the 16 cases where this happened and the call it the 12 that ended up w at war and the four that didn't? Well, let me start with the big idea and then we'll drill down. Great. So basically, Thucydides had a big idea. So Thucydides, the founder and father of history, was watching what happened in classical Greece 2,500 years ago. And he wrote famously, it was the rise of Athens and the fear that this instilled in Sparta that caused the war. So there's a concept that a rising disruptor and an established incumbent end up in a rivalry that often leads to war. I then coined this term Thucydides trap to make this concept vivid. And then uh, in the Thucydides trap case project, we looked at the last 500 years we found 16 times a rising power threatened to displace a ruling power. 12 of them ended in war, four in not war. So there's the puzzle. So think uh, next month we'll be celebrating, a we'll pause to remember, the final day of a war that became so devastating that historians had to create a whole new category. They called it World War. That's why it's World War I. Yeah. In that case, a incident as inconsequential apparently as the assassination of a minor figure, the Archduke of the Austro-Hungarian Emperor, became the spark that created a fire that burned down the whole of Europe. Mm. Yeah. So in this uh, series of cases, each one is interestingly different, but as Henry Kissinger said, there's a lens here for piercing through the noise and news of the day to get the underlying dynamic, what's happening in relations between a rising China and a ruling U.S. Americans are accustomed to being at the top of every pecking order for a hundred years. I mean, we call it the American century. So the whole very idea of another country that would be as big and strong as the U.S., or maybe even bigger or stronger, that strikes many Americans as an affront to who we are. That's right. So in this dynamic, as Thucydides describes, you get a rising power syndrome in which I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I deserve more say, I deserve more sway. The current arrangements were put in place before I ever got here. Think of Uber and the taxi industry, or think of Google and everybody. Yeah. Uh, so wait a minute, so we're gonna change the, the rules. Or the and rules, the rising, rules were made before you showed up. They were made before I showed up. They didn't yeah. take account of my interests. So I'm not really about you. I'm just about expressing myself. Mm -hmm. And these constraints seem to be constraining me. So they have to be adjusted. And the ruling power, again in this syndrome, looks and says, wait a minute, what the hell is going on? Mm -hmm. Who created the environment in which you ever got to emerge? Who provided the framework this is not simply the status quo. This is the good order, and you should take your place in it. Yeah. Become a responsible stakeholder. And in almost every one of these cases, the rising power thinks the ruling power is unreasonable, the ruling power is right. Then you get a multiplication of, of misunderstandings. A third party's action becomes a provocation, like the assassination of an archduke. Or as you, one as leads you to the other. Book, potentially North Korea. North Korea, Taiwan. Taiwan, Hong Taiwan's Kong. Taiwan's a very good candidate. Hong Kong's an interesting. But even a trade war could escalate to a real war. Right. And we saw that happen in the, 
the run-up to what became Pearl Harbor and Japan's at attack on the U.S. Yeah, you mentioned that this was the U.S.'s, uh, call it golden century or the century of the U.S. And the interesting juxtaposition is, as we all know, China views the last century as their century of humiliation. Exactly. The clash in histories, as they each understand it, mm -hmm. we think it was kind of natural and that the, where we are now is natural. And they think this was a century of humiliation in which Westerners with technology came to exploit them. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty different picture. There's also different cultures. So in China, as you know, the Mandarin word for China means center of the universe. In their story, they are the sun. Every other country is a tributary that circulates around it. And they are custom in their story for 4,000 years to ruling everything they could see. We imagine that the USA means number one. So that clash of both cultures and then values. We think individual liberty is the fundamental basis for building a society. They think order and control mm -hmm. is the fundamental way of running a country, if you ask Xi Jinping. Mm. So the pictures of international relations and then interests. So we think that it's natural that the US Navy is the arbiter of events in the Pacific. They think we're operating in their backyard and that they should be the person that decides who builds an island in to, the South China Sea. I can't wait to get into that. If you don't mind, I'm going to stay, stay big and then we're actually yeah. going to get into all of those things that you brought up. Do you have an overarching view of what is China's grand strategy? What is it? You know, when I go to the grand strategy classes at Yale and I think about these things, um, it seems like a nation state can have a grand strategy. It sure. doesn't seem like someone who has a revolving door at the top can have a grand strategy because it'll change every four years, every eight years, or every two years in Congress. So Good how, do you, how do you think about China's grand strategy? What exactly is it? Well, I think uh, China's grand strategy, as Xi Jinping said explicitly when he became president, is to make China great again. He made this uh, great rejuvenation of the great Chinese people long before Trump took up this banner. And by making China great again, for him, for him and everybody else in the system, this means restoring China to its natural place at the top of every pecking order where it was until this century of humiliation mm. when the Westerners showed up with their technology. Making China great again means first by 2025, and he's even announced dates and targets, 2025, 2035, 2049. 2025, China is going to be uh, dominate its domestic markets in 10 major new technologies, including driverless cars, AI, quantum computing. In 2035, China is going to be the dominant uh, a force in technology and innovation everywhere. Mm. In 2049, which is the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China, they mean to be and unambiguously number one, and as he said, to have an army that can, quote, fight and win. So going back on this point of whether it's made in China 2025 or their goals for 35 or 49, to have supremacy on the technological battle, battlefront, which you write a lot about in your book, is both being offensive and defensive, but you write about it primarily being offensive uh, in times of need. Sure. When you go back to the acquisition of that of that property, of that technological know-how, that intellectual property, whether you read the Defense Department's uh, declassified piece on DIUX, mm -hmm. uh, or whether you read Lighthizer's piece uh, to the President uh, detailing intellectual property theft, is the plan that President Xi have uh, supremacy at any cost, meaning they will take it, they will misappropriate it, they will pay for it, they will, like, are they, going to get, are they going to gather technology at the rate they've been gathering it and, and taking it from the rest of the world, or do you think that they'll actually start with a base and, and grow it themselves? Well, I would say both. Uh, okay. So in the book, I describe uh, what a Chinese friend explained to me, their strategy. They he said, most companies have a strategy of R&D, so research and development. We have a strategy of RD&T, research, development, and theft. Yeah. And actually, if you can steal intellectual property, it's a lot cheaper than having to research it yourself or develop it. So I would say as a first approximation, they steal whatever they can get away with. Mm -hmm. And actually, President Trump is interesting, his evolution on this. He initially was blaming China for stealing our intellectual property. 
And then his current view, as he's expressed in tweets and otherwise, is the, I should blame my predecessors. They let him get away with it. <laughs> of course, that's what I would do if I could get away with it. So basically, from a Chinese perspective, I think they will continue doing what they're doing to the extent that they can get away with it. Mm, that's interesting. And when you think about the scale, if you've read all of the reports to date, the, the scale from all of them is kind of, um, it's, it's, they're congruent with one another between 200 and 300 billion a year. It's hard to quantify. Uh, but that amounts over a 10-year period to two or three trillion dollars worth of true intellectual property from, uh, one would argue that the U.S.'s greatest asset is our intellectual property Great. and our kind of supremacy in education. And uh, how, how do we stop that? Well, I would say that's a huge challenge because if you've become accustomed to letting this happen, mm. and if a lot of it happens actually aided and abetted by American companies in the sense that an American company or a European company that wants to operate in China, mm. they want access to the market. Mm. China has the biggest market. And so the Chinese extract, uh, even in this uh, you know, requirement to require technology to build plants. So then if I then have a big enough investment there, when they're stealing intellectual property from me, I come and complain to the U.S. government. This is horrible, terrible, terrible. But when it comes to a meeting with the, uh, the leadership of China, I'm very polite because I know these are tough guys and they will punish me if I'm too vocal in public. So I think they've had a pretty good strategy for doing what they're doing. And as you say, they can have a government that has a plan. So think of the Chinese government as the first approximation. You would think of Google or of uh, Amazon or of Apple. Mm. So they have a chief executive. I mean, it's called the chief of everything. Right. They have a plan the way a company would have a plan. They allocate resources with respect to the plan. They try to manage and control this. Mm. Now, we all know that when the Soviets, Soviet Union did a version of this and tried to have a command and control economy, it didn't work. So we all know market economies work better. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we believe. But they believe they can manage their economy in this way and can take advantage of things that we can't take advantage of. And I think this is a, co a contest. Now, I interestingly have been talking to the Google people about this, and Eric Schmidt in particular, who's very thoughtful about this. He says, if the Soviet Union had had uh, basically uh, Google and uh, Apple the, the, had, had the technology of both the big data, uh, search, and, uh, and collection of data about everything, they might have been more successful. Mm. What they do when looking at their markets is look at a pretty broad span of data. They ask a lot of questions with AI. They make choices on that basis. I still don't believe it. I, I'm, I'm too, uh, I think, uh, uh, liberal in the European sense of thinking individual freedom is too much part of the human soul and the breast uh, and is likely to be more creative and more successful. But I would say, look at the last, uh, if we just take the record of the 21st century, if you were a Martian watching this game, mm -hmm you would be not so clear because uh, the American democracy has looked increasingly dysfunctional mm -hmm. and this Chinese authoritarian model has worked better than I would have suspected. Yeah, me too. And you mentioned, you mentioned in your book that something that uh, takes uh, to build a railroad here, it may take um, five years. And you know, $50 billion, and in China they can build one in five months because they don't need the permitting. There are a lot of, there are a lot of pros and cons to their model versus ours, but that leads me into a question of, do you think the recent economic supremacy slash growth that China has enjoyed for the last five to 10 years, really since 2008, 2009, do you think that has legitimized Xi's uh, ascendancy to where he is today? And do you think that that's at risk if, if they have even a, a mild recession? Well, it's certainly uh, nothing succeeds like success. So, uh, uh, and she who was also, uh, and his uh, key associate, uh, Lu Ha, mm -hmm. who's the person who's in charge of the economic activity and, and the American uh, trade 
current relationship mm -hmm. have been part of what was happening even since 2008, right. so just as you said. So as they look at their spectacular success since 2008 relative to everybody else, 40% of all the growth in the world, in the whole world, mm -hmm. since 2008 has happened in only one country, mm. China. Say this, thing. this is out of sight. Yep. I mean, it's literally out of sight. We've never seen anything like this in the historical record before. So from the perspective of Chinese, this just sounds like, okay, these guys, I don't know. They seem to know how to run the bus. The bus is working fine. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with this or that that they're doing. I don't like somebody coming and telling me whether uh, you know, I'm socially reliable by watching my social media accounts and spying on me all the time. Mm -hmm. But if all this is working fine, you can keep, keep driving the bus. I don't so know. If they, but I'm saying that's the current differential to the to success. Right. But if they, to your question, if they should falter, so there should be a serious decline in their performance, or maybe even a crisis economically, then the legitimacy that's based on your uh, driving the bus so successfully has just been eliminated. Mm -hmm. so, and in that case, right now you can see Xi Jinping and the regime have decided just to be comfortable and be safe, and maybe even to strengthen it, we need a second leg to stand on. So the second leg is nationalism. Mm -hmm. So nationalism is you can now be prouder to be a Chinese, and you can you see this in your life dealing with Chinese. They say, I'm standing a little taller. I'm feeling a little better. Right? Right. I, I don't need to, to, to kowtow quite the extent that I used to do. So Chinese are feeling na more nationalistic and more proud to be Chinese, and they should to look and see what they've accomplished. But if the economic piece were going badly, and so they had to rely on the nationalist leg to stand on, and if things go badly, I don't blame my management of my economy, I blame you. I find some, I externalize. Uh, that's another sort of dynamic that Thucydides would describe mm. for the rising power who now was faltering, mm. trying to deal with the ruling power, not by declaring war. So this, in the Thucydides story, neither the rising power nor the ruling power wants a war. Mm -hmm. Neither declares a war. What happens is somebody else does something, and then I feel obliged to respond to it. So let's imagine if the Chinese economy faltered, and she's trying to justify nationalism, and the Taiwanese discovering that the mainland is not doing so well, mm -hmm. want to be more independent. There's a devil's uh, uh, cocktail because we have, we're committed to helping the Thai, not to fight for them necessarily, but to helping them. But if China were to try to seize Taiwan or to basically paralyze it, which it could militarily by just bracketing it with missile tests yeah. like they did in 1996, either we come to their defense or Taiwan has to submit for a, for a nationalist Chinese the reunification of this uh, re rebellious province mm. would be a huge win. So mm. if you could deliver that, you could get reelected. Yeah, you know. which would be somewhat of a fulfillment of Admiral Liu's you know, uh, first island chain plan. Exactly, um, exactly. When we go back to the economics of the situation, what's interesting about China is They've grown their GDP in RMB terms by a thousand percent over ten years, or sorry, by five hundred percent over ten years. They've grown their debts by a thousand percent, and so they believe it's sustainable. We believe it's unsustainable. And um, I think the, the question, which you know a lot more about than I do, so this I'm I'm listening and studying, and I've been looking at this. So the question of what level of debt a, a, a entity can sustain is a very interesting question. Mm. So for a long time. I mean, if you think about it from a company's point of view, let's take, for example, Elon Musk. So I have a company that never earned a profit in, for a year. And I'm sustaining how much debt? A huge amount. Mm -hmm. So you and I would say that's reckless, or I would say. I mean, it at least makes me, would make me very nervous. Mm -hmm. So I, don't th I think that they believe, because they have more instruments of control, mm -hmm. and because most of the debt is internal, that they can manage a level of debt that historically other economies would find 
unmanageable. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. You had a number of companies, including financial companies here, that imagined that before 2008, especially when they had a lot of uh, liabilities that weren't quite, uh, they were sort of in the shadows a yeah. little bit. Yeah. It's, I think it comes okay. down to, the, again, the tale of two worlds. They have a world that's R&B based, that's domestic. To your point, they can, they can restructure any loan, they can print some more money, they can pretend things didn't happen. The trees can fall in the woods and we won't hear them to a certain extent. But then their apparatus to trade with the rest of the world is in dollars, euros, or yen. No one will take RMB as a settlement currency. So China represents 15% of global GDP, but less than 1% of global trade settles in RMB internationally. So they need dollars, euros and yen, but mostly dollars. And um, that positive current account that they used to run, which is now negative, uh, gave them an additional supply of dollars every year. So whether it's financial investment flows, Chinese corporate borrowing, or trade benefiting them, those are all three inflow uh, avenues for dollars. One of those has turned to an outflow. We'll see the rest, but Chinese corporate borrowing has gone to about a trillion two in dollar terms in just the last four years. So Ooh. they've hit this point where they still need to borrow more and more and more dollars. So to your point, it's not all internal anymore. It's now external. Interesting, interesting. And, uh, but, but who knows how long that takes. Um, yes. Just current account negativity is a problem. But we, we're, we're here to talk about you. Let's talk about chapter, in chapter seven, you, you alluded to this kind of difference in values, difference in cultures as being uh, one, of the, one of the key issues. And you said Thucydides said, uh, you know, our efforts have no equivalence among people who do not share our values. In your, in your book, use that quote. There are enormous contrasts between China and the U.S. What do you see as kind of the, the tinder or the, the places where this fire could get started and the differences in our cultural values? Uh, we have completely different cultural values. And right. how, what do you think the top three are? So for Americans, liberty is the foundation. Liberty for individuals, rights the Bill for a person. So life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Yeah. For the Chinese, order is the fundamental value. Chaos is the fundamental uh, you know, uh, risk. So a uh, culture that's built on order and which abuses the rights of people, especially ones thought to be dangerous for order, mm. is an affront to Americans, but if we, poor Uyghurs, in uh, Xi'an who are locked up in uh, basically prisons and whatever. So you've got a value component there at, at that level. Secondly, uh, the image of who you are. So the Chinese image, as I said before, of who they are is we are the center of the universe. Mm. The emperor is the top of the pyramid. Yep. Everybody else relates to him by kowtowing. That means they bend submit. to, to bit. Yep. So that's who we are. Americans believe that who we are is number one. Some think that there were our, were in our endowment. Some think we had this forever. Some think it was by hard work. But in any case, it's become you know, our, our identity. And then third, in terms of what happens internationally, the American story is we have been the provider of an inter international order and especially an Asian order that actually has enabled the Asian miracles all over Asia. So we provided basically the economic and security framework that has enabled Japan and then uh, Singapore and then ultimately China. Nobody more than this is the most uh, peaceful, prosperous experience Asia has had in all of its history. So we think that's a good way for things to be and that's the way things should remain. They think the U.S. Navy should no longer be patrolling the seas sea. in, their, yeah. in their area. As I say in the book, uh, one of the Chinese uh, PLA Navy admirals said to me, China sees China seas. He says, look at your map. What's the name of this body of water? It's called the South China Sea. It's not called the American Sea. So why the U.S. Navy there? Look at this other here, East China Sea. This is not called, you know, Open Sea. This is called the China Sea for some reason. So their perception of this is the same as Teddy Roosevelt's perception of what was ha happening in the Caribbean. Exactly right. As I try to explain. So now you can see how these differences in kind of cultures and values and interests set up a dynamic 
that when you have the power shift going on in the rise versus rule rivalry, leave both hugely vulnerable to external actions that nobody wanted. So nobody, nobody in the U.S. wants Taiwan to do something dramatic or yeah. don't want North Korea to do something provocative. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't control Kim Jong-un. <laughs> right. We don't control uh, events in Taiwan. And, and in the ec economic realm, we know that uh, when things get started, I mean, you could see in Trump's tweet uh, in response to China's retaliation for his latest rounds of sanctions, he's now blaming them more and making it a challenge to himself. So again, this adds another element to this competition, which then creates risk. Hmm. And so, I don't want to get—I don't want to get too political yeah. at all. And I, but but I must ask this question, because it's it's a question more on the balance of power and trade. Every president uh, in the last 25 years says they're going to get tough on China, but no one's done it. Right. So so Trump is not someone I voted for. Right. He's not a friend of mine. However. In foreign policy land and in the land of economic foreign policy, I, I agree with almost everything he's done. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how you think about, forget about his tweets hey. <laughs> and how he gets there, yeah. but what he's done uh, in, in re-leveling the playing field, is that something you approve of or is that something uh, you would do differently? So it's complicated, but I would say that the, uh, uh, the, the recognition that uh, just accepting the way things were and have been for the last 25 years, mm -hmm. which each successive president has ultimately done with a, with a, uh, a theory or vision that said, as China becomes richer, it'll become more like us. Yeah. So it'll become wealthier, then it'll become more democratic, democratic. Yeah. then it'll take its place as a responsible stakeholder. So. There was a there was a theory of the case, and that theory of the case was the theory of the case for the U.S. government to try to encourage China's growth, and that theory of the case was also the dominant theory for leaders of global finance mm -hmm. and leaders of global production. So, if I were running a major international company, I've been trying to integrate supply chains with China because this is all part of the story that we all get richer together and this makes China more democratic and then they'll be more like us and then they'll be more peaceful. So I had a good story. That story has looked worse and worse over some period of time, but it's very hard to go from this picture of how I'm relating to you and trying to encourage you to grow and then I look up and wake up and decide, whoa, wait a minute, this is when you were a small dragon that I was being friendly to that was almost like a pet. Now this dragon is as big as I am. I mean, what the hell happened? So you can look in the uh, Secretary Mattis's new national military strategy is even breathless at some stage in, in which it's just looking, saying, what, what? And as one of my Chinese friends said, he said, wait a minute, we haven't been hiding. The fact that uh, many Americans have had their heads stuck in the sands of the Middle East fighting wars for the 21st century, mm -hmm. that's not our fault. Mm -hmm. That's what you've been doing. We haven't been hiding here. We're, we've just been growing, trying to realize our hope to be have wealthier citizens, have a better country, bigger science, so, mm -hmm. so. so Trump is reflecting this wake up that's occurring about the fact that lo and behold, there is a country that's emerged, and it is rivaling us in many dimensions, and its behavior is unacceptable. So then the question of how, how to deal with that, and I think the, I would say, in the recognition of the problem, I think the Trump administration has done a good job, or doing a good job, in trying to figure out a strategy for adjusting the relationship without falling into Thucydides trap. There's the, there's the rub. I've been such a, uh, since uh, the last 15 months since the book was published, basically pursuing avidly in China every month and in Washington every week and here in Cambridge and everywhere else I can, the question how to escape Thucydides' trap mm -hmm. 
without giving up anything vital for either the U.S. or for China. So from the American point of view, we are not about to cede to China the dominant position in the world and give up the idea that we play a very special role. So that's not going to happen. And from the Chinese point of view, they want to keep growing and making China greater. So can those two things happen in the same world? To which the answer is, I hope so. Because they sound they, mutually exclusive because if to they, me. If they, I don't think they are. Okay. So I, I think that, but I think being inventive about what would constitute a strategy for fundamentally adjusting the economic relationship so that it would be fair rules, fairly observed and fairly guaranteed. Now, even there, if from an American point of view, because I'm a very red-blooded American, so I look at this and I think, I still like the idea that we should have be the biggest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. So I, that's what I would like. And then you know, I look at it and I say, but there's four times as many Chinese as we are. So if they're only one quarter as productive as we are, they're going to have an economy as big as ours. I mean, they seem to be pretty smart and pretty determined and pretty hungry. What if they were half as productive as we are? Mm -hmm. Just half. Well, now they got an economy twice as big as ours. What is the world in which we're dealing with the China that's twice as big as we are? So they could have twice as big a defense budget as we can? Uh, wait a minute. I don't, I don't know how that works. And so I, I think partly Americans are struggling with the idea of just the idea of another country that would be big and strong. And challenging us. And if we were then going to be smart about this, we might begin to have to think about some things that we hadn't thought about before. before. So we can't simply cling to the status quo everywhere, not if the fundamental so power have changed dramatically. We may have to understand our alliances are more important than we thought, because if you're now twice as big as I am, if I have two other guys here that are about my size, now we have three to two. Well, Japan and uh, South Korea and Australia and maybe in principle India, depending on what should happen there. So I think we're in a period where what's needed is a lot more inventiveness about what, what, how to make this relationship work over the year, decade, 25 years, where from our perspective, a system which is party-led authoritarian as a society gets wealthier, I don't think so. I would say that's going to become stressful just because I believe in every breast there's a, somebody yearning to be free. Mm. But they would bet, and some of my Chinese friends would bet, you guys have become so uh, caught up by consumption and so caught up in you know, the ephemeral and so uh, lazy uh, that your democratic system, I mean, look at it. It's, it's not going to work. And so you're going to come to decide that you're going to have to have a system more like ours. I, mm. I'd say I don't think so, but I'd be prepared to play that out in a peaceful environment, betting on our uh, fundamental con concepts of values and governance rather than theirs. So w when I read your book, and I think everybody that reads it, reads the title, reads the full text cover to cover, and we come away thinking there is some percentage probability that Graham Allison thinks um, could take us to war, and there's some percentage probability that, that he takes it, say, we may not. We may get into these four right. areas of peace. If you were to give me the probability of war after all the work you've done and, and after all the thought you've put to it, what is that probability? If you put it into a number for me. Well, it's a very hard to do for, so, uh, and I'm schizophrenic about it, so I don't really have a single number, so let me just describe. Is it better than half? I would say, I, my schizophrenia is I'm congenitally an optimist. Okay. So I don't believe ultimately that things will turn out badly because I believe we will end up finding our way to a degree of imagination. On the other hand, if I were simply analyzing the and case the on the basis of the record, yeah. I would be pessimistic and say it was 
as likely as not, maybe slightly more likely than not. Okay. So, but not necessary and not inevitable. Yeah. So the question is, what do we do? So if you, the analogy I, or one that I take some inspiration from is the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So there were many wise heads that said, in the 1950s and 1960s, that was inevitable that there would be a war, even a nuclear war, between the Soviet Union and the United States. And people today can't believe it because of what Russia's become. But when John Kennedy became president, 1961, he believed that by the 70s, the Soviets would have an economy as big as we did. Yep. And that's what the economists all believe. So you look at that and you say, well, what did we do? And what was developed was a strategy with four or five pillars that became the Cold War strategy over the period of the 40s and then in the 50s and 60s and 70s that we basically followed, strangely enough, even in the political system, as you had said before, that alternates with parties and alternates with presidents for four decades to a point of victory. In the Cold War strategy, the key pillars of it, each included initiatives that seemed slightly crazy or naive or unrealistic when people first suggested them. I mean, the one I like the best is the Marshall Plan. Oh, yeah. So it's June of 1947, so a year after, a year and a half after the war, Marshall came to Harvard, gave the commencement speech, and he said, I have an idea. We've just been fighting this war. We were spending half of our GDP. We've now given that up. We're back to the building America at home. We've demobilized all the troops and come home. But I have one other idea. Uh, the poor Europeans were devastated and uh, the Soviets are aggressive. We should tax ourselves one and a half percent of GDP a year for the next several years and send the money to Europe and help rebuild countries like Germany and Italy, whose guys were just killing us like, two years ago. Right. Nobody said that was a good idea. Most people said, what are you, what? You know, nobody's going to be in favor of this. But lo and behold, great leadership from Truman and from Vandenberg, who was the Republican chair of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and people in the society managed, and lo and behold, by 1948, we were doing this. Mm. So you look at this and say, what would be like that today? Could people become imaginative about some things maybe the U.S. and China could do together. So, unfortunately, I have a nuanced view of, yeah. of that exact period of time in U.S. history where we had just, well, for number one, we had won the war. Right. Right, and we, both sides deficit spent going into the war, right? right. That 1946 was the U.S.'s highest level of debt we've ever had. GDP right. is about 106%. You know, to the victor went the spoils, right. and to the loser went defeat and default, right? And so when we talk about importing that idea to today, I shudder to think about it because we had eliminated the productive capacity of almost two continents, right? right? And we ran trade surpluses with every single trading partner in 1946. We did. We ran positive trade surpluses with everyone, we re and the Marshall Plan helped us do so. Right. And World War II killed about 3% of the world's population. And so when I think about what could we do today to kind of get into a Marshall Plan scenario. No, no I'm not proposing a Marshall Plan. No, I'm I saying, know, I know. I'm You're saying, saying a collective saying, project say, to build I, well, things. I would say that I, if you thought about that idea in June of 1947, mm. the idea that Americans are exhausted after a war mm -hmm. and need to work on the domestic agenda, Truman actually at the time thought that the most important thing was to have a health care. Yeah. So now somebody says, I have an idea. Let's pay taxes to send money to foreigners, even though it was part of this whole picture. Right. It was just politically. Yeah. People Crazy. say, you're insane. Yeah. They're not clear. Nobody's going to. Yeah, that's a good so, point. So I don't think my, my idea is not we should have a Marshall Plan now. An idea equally radical, another yeah. radical idea was NATO. Mm. So NATO. George Washington and every other president said, beware entangling alliances. You get into an alliance with these Europeans and they'll drag you into a war you don't want to create. In NATO, we made a commitment in Article 5 yeah. that an attack on one of these Europeans an is an attack on us. On us. I know. Well, what? And Japan. What? Okay, you would say that's crazy. That turned out to be a, bril a brilliant idea and was part of the success of the Cold War strategy. So I just say the fact that 
I think we need to be thinking of and considering ideas that when you first say them or hear them, you just say that's radical yeah. or unrealistic that's or, a good point. or not feasible. And so that's what we need a we need a surge of imagination in this space. And I think actually people in the uh, economic and financial domain may turn out to be more imaginative about this than people in the national security establishment because there's a ten tendency to kind of stick with the things we know and do that we're very you know comfortable with. And I think sticking with the comfortable past and holding to the status quo is clearly infeasible. I mean, yeah, another it's line, what got us to where we are today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, uh, so Henry Kissinger uh, taught me this, uh, this is my old professor many, many years ago. He said, you know, really in the end our core strategy is to overwhelm problems, this is internationally, overwhelm problems with resources. And in 1945-50, we have half the world's GDP. That's right. Into the Cold War, we have 25% of the world's GDP. Today, we have 14% of the world's GDP. So a party with 14% or in five years, 12% cannot, doesn't have the market power mm. to deal with problems by simply overwhelming them with resources. resources. So you have to be smarter. Okay, so that means changing a lot of stuff that we do in radical ways. And I think for Americans, this will be as painful as it you know, will be in this interaction with the Chinese. Interesting. And when you talk about potential war scenarios, I'm taking you to kind of chapter eight of your book where you say kind of from, from here to war. A lot of the things you put in there were extremely provocative to me. I, I typically study the, study the financial markets and the historical culture, but I don't, haven't really thought about the kinetic side of things. And some of those scenarios that you talk about, especially with cyber, are fascinating in this day and age. So would you talk about this use it or lose it kind of uh, ideology that you mentioned in, in chapter eight where you, you talk about the, the various edifices of our cyber facilities and uh, that one becomes functionally irrelevant if it's used uh, in the second place. So you talk about that, that idea and some of the ideas you have with a possible run-in of ships or how you think something kinetically could go wrong. So there's, there's two elements in the chapter. One is what's the incident that gets things started? Yeah. And then the second is why does it escalate? Yeah. And the cyber is particularly relevant in the escalation stage. So let's just imagine if I were picking the most likely in the current scene, there are two, Taiwan and uh, North Korea. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, there are five different scenarios in that. If I take the Taiwan case, so basically China is becoming more authoritarian and controlled. Taiwan, uh, which every Chinese believes, is a renegade province of China, and which I never have met a Chinese who wouldn't fight to keep Taiwan. So even though the guys in Taiwan are not calling up Beijing to ask what they can do, they're there, right. they're living in this little bit of pretend land. Do the but, Chinese visit Taiwan very? Yeah, often? they do, and they and they've been. I mean, initially they were trying to seduce them. So many of the businesses there are run by people who also have a second family in China. It's the whole thing is very complicated and have you know, facilities that operate there. So it's, a, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an artificial environment now. So basically, but if you're Taiwanese, you're accustomed to being relatively free as a person. I mean, as free as somebody in South Korea. So the idea that you would now be reintegrated into a country that's going to be governing you in a different way you're not in favor of. So you, if you take anybody that's 30 years old and younger, or even 40 years old and younger, they've lived in a free country, they don't want to be part of China. Yep. The same way you get people in Hong Kong, Hong Kong they don't want to be, okay, you can see that all the time. Yep. And so when the Chinese then say to them, well you can't have people run for office who are in favor, they say, forget about it. You so, can run, but we won't swear you That's in. right, that's exactly, exactly. <laughs> so the Taiwanese, for whatever reason, go off uh, the way they were in 1996. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, again, you won't remember most people, but in 1996, the Taiwanese were making a move towards independence. Yeah. China responded by missile tests that bracketed the island, mm. which therefore made it impossible for anybody to bring a ship to straight. supply. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, they're an island. Ultimately, they depend on ships coming. 
So in 1996, I was in the Pentagon at the time, Clinton decided we would move two carriers up to basically force them to back down. We did. They backed down. They were humiliated. And they immediately began building a missile force on land yeah. that would be able to sink our carriers, which they've done very successfully. Yeah. So now, if that same incident should occur, uh, we would be worrying, can we bring a carrier up to help defend Taiwan? And if we did, it could easily be sunk by yeah. one of these missiles. So now, imagine that's the way the game gets started. So now they've, we've sunk a, they've sunk a carrier. 5,000 people died. Okay? Yeah. That's a big event. So now you're the president. What do you do? So the Defense Department would say our policy calls on destroying all the missiles that could do that again. Yep. That means attacking the Chinese mainland. So now you're attacking facilities in China. So then I, I'm not going to leave your homeland alone if I'm playing the Chinese hand, if you're bombing my homeland. Right. So I can either try to reach something all the way to San Diego, or I can simply in cyber go and turn down, cut off your, uh, your electrical grid. grid. Yeah. Yeah. And you say, what a minute, whoa, what the, what are you, what's happening? So there's no electricity uh, in the, the Northeast. Yeah. So I then respond against your cyber capabilities because if I don't, you're going to make it impossible for me to do so. Mm. So one thing leads to the other. And historically, that kind of escalation ladder has ultimately ended in a full-scale war that the two parties didn't imagine that they wanted, but neither could stand down at any you know, stage of that yeah. process. Well, you introduced this concept of escalating to de-escalate as well. So right. how, how, how could that work? Well, the, if, if we've started down this, this path, Mm -hmm. And you're playing the American hand, I'm playing the Chinese hand. So if I'm trying to remind you how vulnerable your whole so society is, mm. uh, suppose I say, okay, look, why don't I just close down your financial markets for a day? Right. Just for a day. Uh, and then you can explain whether there was an accident or make whatever story up you want. I'm not going to tell I did it. Right. I'm just I mean, letting you know I'm I can. Call, I'll call you up and tell you, watch and see what happens tomorrow. And uh, I hope this doesn't go any further. And so that's called escalating. So I've gone pretty far up the ladder. And then you could look and say, well, gee, can I close the Chinese financial markets? Well, uh, that then depends on the state of the offenses and the defenses for the two sides. Mm -hmm. And cyber is moving at such a pace. And another great accelerant is space. So basically all of the American forces depend on uh, satellites right. for both observing what's going on, for targeting, yep. for communication. Right. All those satellites are big, fat, juicy targets. Yep. So they're not hard to shoot out of the sky. And so there's an event going on in the Taiwan Straits, and all of a sudden I'm playing the Chinese yeah. hand, and I just say, I take out your uh, satellites and you look and you think, whoa, I can't even see what's going on. Mm. I'm in trouble having my ships to communicate with each other. I can't target things. Uh, that's probably a place where you want to stop, we hope, right. if I'm playing the Chinese hand. Right. Or you may say, wait a minute, you're not getting away with that. Right. So again, one thing can lead to the other. Yeah, it's really it's really provocative, and uh, I suggest anyone that hasn't read your book, they should they should read it and reread it. and. Uh, I'm going to conclude with one last question. Um, is China our friend? That's a great question. So there was a, uh, I was in China in April for a session with chief executives and the China Development Forum. There was a session called China Friend, uh, Rival, or Adversary. And I was just, I said the answer is yes. <laughs> so basically, in some domains, China is our friend. Mm. In some domains, China is our rival. In some domains, China is our adversary. And conceptually, getting our head around that for Americans, many, and many people in the strategic community, you know, I need to just know one or the other. Mm. In the current strategic conversation, and this is across the policy spectrum and across the political spectrum, especially in Washington, there's this sea change going on. Mm. So China used to be our friend and partner. So up until the end of the Obama administration, if you look at official documents, when you describe China, it's called 
our partner or strategic partner. If you look today at all the documents, they're called our adversary, and even in the Defense Department, our enemy. Mm -hmm. So there's just been this flip. And the impact of that uh, in every space, whether it's, okay, so therefore, an investment in American technology is by an enemy or adversary. Mm -hmm. So I better, a supply chain that is dependent upon that's on my enemy or adversary provided by a, the Chinese economic performance. Before, did we want it to be better or worse? We were thinking better is better That's because right. it was going to make them more blah, blah, blah. Now, I would say in Washington, they would prefer it to be worse. Mm -hmm. So, And the Chinese are just kind of getting it, uh, thinking, wait a minute, what in the world happened? Yeah. You know, we were friendly for... Obama and then for Bush and for Clinton and you know people said bad words right before the election but they didn't now they're thinking whoa have these people you know basically done a backflip mm. and I would say we're just seeing the the first phase of a sea change mm. and the sea change on the surface is basically reflecting this underlying Thucydide and dynamic mm. where increasingly China will be seen in our face and in our space because they just simply have got bigger and stronger right. and are pushing out. And they would say, well, this is just us growing. I mean, this is just natural growth and whatever. And we say, well, wait a minute, but you're, you're now in my space. You're now you know, rivaling me here. And that kind of dynamic, unless people are smart and creative, mm could lead to some crazy thing happening in North Korea or in uh, the South China Sea or in Taiwan mm -hmm. that I can't ignore. Right. So I make some limited, and then you can't ignore it, and one thing leads to the other, and there we go. The best advice someone gave me on China years ago was look at what they do and don't listen to what they say. I agree. And uh, I think watching what they do Actually, watching what people do is often better, maybe even in the U.S. You're exactly than right. What they say. Well, Graham Allison, thank you so much for spending this time with me and with, uh, with us. And um, I was, it was just an honor to be here and, and uh, hear uh, your view of history and also your advice. Pleasure Thanks. to be with you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.